Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is John Van Lunen, and you are listening to Treasures of the Outer Banks, the podcast that celebrates the people and places to make this area special. In this episode, I had the chance to sit down with Mark Corbett. I don't say this lightly, but Mark Corbett is an adventurer and an explorer. He works on a dive boat out of Hatteras, and he's done at least 60 dives around the Outer Banks. His goal is to hit 90 of the known wrecks that are in this area. When you hear him speak, you know he has an incredible skill set and a knowledge and the courage to dive over 100 feet below the ocean surface. This was an amazing talk with Mark. I think you'll appreciate everything he does. So sit back and enjoy. So do you own your own dive boat? I do not own a dive boat at the present time. Um, so what boat I'm, do you work on? I work on the Lion's Paw out of Hatteras Inlet. We are behind the red and white in Hatteras Village. Okay. And how many, let's see, so is this your full-time job? No, this is my summer job and I've been doing it for about, this is my 14th season. Okay. What's your full-time job? My full-time job is renovation and carpentry. Okay. Is this a, a fun kind of way to get away from that for a few months? This is something I would do all the time if you could. Yeah. But we just don't do too much diving in the winter. Not because we couldn't. It's because the weather makes it so difficult to get out there that you really can't plan around it. Sometimes we will go diving in the winter. But there's a reason we have so many shipwrecks here. Yeah. You know. And the Gulf Stream off of Hatteras is always warm. Right. I've heard this. I've never experienced it, but I've heard this. Oh, yeah. You know, we're close. That's part of the Outer Banks. That's part of why we have so many shipwrecks is we have two bodies of water. The North Atlantic and the South Atlantic bite waters is what they call them that come in and they meet at Hatteras. And then going around the whole thing is the Gulf Stream, which means you have what people traditionally call the Labrador Current, Right. Coming in from the north, which can be very cold. And you have the slightly warmer South Atlantic current. And they come in and they do what they're going to do. Different fish species live in each one. And then the Gulf Stream is super warm, clear blue water. It's the same water from the Caribbean only three weeks late. Right. You know, as it's coming right. up the coast. And you get a lot of fog. You get a lot of current. You get a lot of challenging conditions. And then you throw in the Diamond Shoals, which is the extension of yep. Cape Point. Yep. And it goes out about 12, 13 miles. And ships do everything and have always done everything they could to avoid it. Right. But back in the days before we had things like... GPS <laughs> and modern navigation systems, Lorian. You know, if you're out there in cloudy weather, which we often have, and fog, you have no way to navigate. So right. these ships ran into the Diamond Shoals or they ran into the coast before or after the Diamond Shoals trying to avoid it. They'd, they'd hit the northern coast because they'd be making their to, turn too soon. Maybe they're going into the Gulf Stream and they're, they're slowed down. But this right. is before you could look at how fast you were going. Right. So these ships have been piling up for years and it makes the Outer Banks an incredible place to dive. How crazy shallow is that Diamond Shoals, say, 10 or 12 miles out? Oh, it's unbelievable. It, it's like only 40 feet deep. You could stay down almost all day if you had the capability in the air. Right. Um, but it's challenging. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of our shallower dives. You know, and we have shallow dives up and down the coast off the beach, too, because there's lots of shipwrecks, like at the Third Street wrecks. But the Diamond Shoals has a lot of Gulf Stream current that can come into it. You can start off your dive without any current and end up with a knot by the time you're done just over the time you're out there if the current decides to come in. Right. That's what makes the Outer Banks diving challenging is the Gulf Stream versus the other waters. Right. And when you're, let's say it's summertime, you know, what are you looking at to figure out if it's good diving? I mean, you just, has the, are you looking for winds that have been calm for a couple of days? And exactly. It's, We're it's, looking for good winds. 
And then we have tools nowadays, like you can look on uh, NOAA websites and get the currents where they oh, are, really? at least the surface current. Right. Now, when you're diving some of these deeper wrecks that we go to, you may have three different current directions on the way down, right. which can, you know, you can only really see the top one from the boat and from radar. But we end up looking at the weather, we look at the currents, and when the conditions present themselves, it can be the best diving in the world. Right. Is it still when you motor out in the mornings, you, you've looked at everything, you planned, you motor out in the morning, is it still kind of 50-50 whether it's going to be? Absolutely. Yeah. You, know, you know, the Outer Banks diving, I have always said, you get what you put into it. If you decide, well, I'm going to be going down there and I'm going to try to dive this year and you plan one dive trip, well, you got about a 50-50 shot <laughs> right. Right. at best. Right. You, you have to try to do it a lot. And it's, it's almost addictive because there's so many different reasons people dive out there. So if you find something you're really into, for me, it's photography. Uh, people ask me, how was your dive? I'm like, I don't know. I haven't looked at the pictures yet. But if you get into it enough that you go a lot, then you will get something really worthwhile out of it. But it's not a very great destination for tourist diving. Like, you know, you're not going to get out there guaranteed every day. I used to be in the water sports business for 25 years and I'd get that question, hey, where can I go snorkeling or diving? Mm -hmm. And I always, I'm scared to tell them to go anywhere because well, yeah. I know it's, it's, not, it's probably not what they're thinking it is. Well, I've always said surfers make the best divers yeah. because they're already used to the ocean around here and they realize that you sort of have to plan things around what the ocean's doing because it's not going to plan around what you're doing. Yeah. And if that's if you can't do it, you know, honestly, it's probably not the greatest dive destination. Just like it's not the greatest surf destination unless you're willing to say, "Hey, the wind's just right and we've got a big groundswell out right. there and we're going." Right. Well, you know, we're a little bit on the opposite end of that. It's like well, we also like the wind to be backed off, but we like there to be no swell, you know, so it's, the diving's easier. Right. And believe me, we've gotten caught in it by mistake many times when the weather forecasts wrong, and we'll be out there in some rather rough stuff. But we try to dive when it's not so rough. So I just thought of something. You're diving. I just was just looking at your Facebook page, and I, you, you do dives in about 140 feet of water or something like that. Mm-hmm. When you go down, are you, how are you finding the boat back up? Well, we dive with two main methods in the outer banks. We dive what's called the Carolina rig, which is you drop the anchor. <clears throat> My job is to go in right after the anchor or with the anchor, and I tie it somewhere on the wreck where it's secure. Gotcha. And then we set up a line from the back of the boat under the boat at about 20, goes down to about 30 feet, meets the anchor line. And you jump in, get on that line, follow it to the anchor line and go down. Okay. And that's part of the discipline of diving, outer banks, wrecks especially, you need to know where the anchor line is. And you need to know where to come back to. So you've got to be a little bit skilled um, a lot of other places in the world, you have a dive master and they'll take care of you. Not here. We are usually advanced level diving, even okay. the shallow stuff, because you need to be able to take care of yourself and you need to be able to remember how to get back to the anchor. And if that means running a line, then you need to have the skill to run the line. And then when the current gets too strong to anchor in, and the divers can't swim down that line against the current. And this mostly happens with our deep diving. We get way out, the further out you go, the further out you get into the Gulf Stream. You know, the Gulf Stream comes closest to the East Coast in Florida and off Cape Hatteras. Yeah. And 
It can be incredibly warm, like 80-something degrees, and incredibly blue. Like, sometimes we can see the shipwrecks from the boat 100 feet down. But when we're diving stuff that's like 200, 300 feet in that range, chances are good there's too much current to dive, and we do what's called drift diving. They do that down in Florida a lot, too, because they are really have Gulf Stream close to the beaches. But we do it on a more advanced level than a lot of places. We'll be diving really deep wrecks, and it takes very skilled, very disciplined divers. But we basically go up current of the wrecks and drop them like paratroopers. Is that right? Yeah. One after the other. You need to be ready to go, all your stuff together. You can't be, like, having trouble clearing your ears, none of that. you got to be on top of your game. But you can drift down, get to the wreck, you do your dive... And then you have to be disciplined as a team enough for everybody to meet back at a certain place at a certain time. And we send a buoy up. It's a, they, they call it an SMB. And you fill it with air and send it up on a reel. And that's where the boat follows you from. That's drift diving. Huh. And it takes a lot of skill, but it allows you to dive in some pretty severe current. When you're dropping down, that must all be line of sight with your buddy? Oh, yeah. It, it, you, you follow the guy in front of you, and the person in the lead's kind of looking at a at a uh, compass and figuring on the drift. And you mostly just look for that dark shape coming up out of the blue yeah. where you're seeing that shipwreck. And we've hit it every time we've done it, but I've been there when they missed. You know, it's a little bit hit or miss. It, 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 if the current's... Going many different ways underwater, it's kind of hard for us to predict exactly where we need to drop the people. And when you get down there, if you don't see the wreck, what you look for is fish because the fish are going to be leading you to the wreck. And, you know, it's part of the skill of diving, that sort of thing, knowing those kinds of things. But there's, there's lots of diving off the Outer Banks from shallow to deep. Right. Right. And everything in between. We've got somewhere, I think, around 90 diveable wrecks in the Outer Banks. And my goal, personally, is to dive all of them yeah. from literally three feet. I mean, you can you can dive a shipwreck underneath the bridge, the new jug handle bridge in Rodan. I saw that, yeah. Uh-huh. Very cool. And we've got it's stuff. Kind of, it's, sorry to interrupt, but it's kind of funny that they built this bridge and realized, oh, crap, there's a shipwreck right here. Well, they did a lot of research on that before they did that. Did they? they? Yeah, and they, and they put the pilings around it, so okay. it's still intact. It's just like you're looking up and hearing cars going over. <laughs> right, it's right, pretty right. neat. Um, and then we've got shipwrecks that are as deep as anyone would even think about trying to scuba dive on. And we've got wrecks that are deeper than you can scuba dive on that have never really been explored before, except once or twice by uh, submarine wow. vessels, you know, uh, submersibles and ROVs. Are there people that are looking for new wrecks? Or, well, you know, I know they're not new, new, but, you know, unfound, undiscovered wrecks? Yes, there are people looking for new wrecks. Uh, the NOAA is out there sometimes looking for things. Uh, ECU. And then probably the most productive is private people. Yeah. And I dive with some people who are looking for wrecks, and I do a good bit of wreck hunting. Um, my big goal is I want to dive everything there is to dive, and I want to find as many along the way as I can. And a good friend of mine is probably the most productive wreck hunter on the Outer Banks. And we work together and do some searching out there. But that's all like kind of hush-hush because everybody who's doing it is sort of trying to somewhat keep it to themselves on some things. So you can't really talk too much about it. But yeah, that's going on around here. And there's a number of missing vessels that are really interesting. Right. And is, does it start? Does it usually start with the history? You know, finding out. Oh, I heard this ship went down back. You know, a hundred years ago. Or is it looking for anomalies on your uh, on your depth finder? 
That's to, there, that's the two kinds. Of, uh, I kind of classify it as two kinds of finding a wreck. Um, the one that's probably more likely is while you're looking for something, maybe on the way home, you find something, and then you're working with a spot, and you have to go back and research what happened near there. Right. And I use a lot of resources around here, like the Outer Banks History Center yeah. has Coast Guard records. Right. They have what went down where. And because David Stick literally found them in the Coast Guard trash can at Oregon <laughs> Inlet. No way. Yeah, it's a it's a great resource. And then there's other, lots of other resources. You know, people are like, they don't even know what half the wrecks are. Actually, they probably do because it was big money and anything that was big money right. was kept record of somewhere. But you've got to know where to look. I go to the National Archives. I go to the State Archives. I research stuff in newspapers.com a lot. Is that right? Yeah. And so when you find a wreck, then you can look at what went down there. The harder way to do it is you want to find a wreck... And you need to figure out where it went down based on the historic record. And then you need to make a search area. You know, that's the more difficult way to do it. Right. But... It's probably high dollar, too. Yeah, it takes a lot of money. I mean, fuel is expensive. Search tools are expensive. Side scan sonars and things like that, you know. Um, But mostly... It takes, you have to put your time in. Yeah. And if you put your effort in, you'll find stuff. I mean, I've identified five, questionably four. I, I, I really, there's one of them that I would have to give credit to David Stick and John Lockhead yeah. for figuring out also. And I think I sort of figured it out on my own and then realized looking in old records that they had identified the same vessel. But there's nothing like the feeling of when you realize that clue that makes it almost certain you have figured something out. You have figured out the identity of a ship that had quite a history in a lot of cases. And you're the only person in the world at that point that really knows. Right. And I, I've figured out five and it's probably my favorite feeling in diving. And it's funny, it's like, I consider diving, going up to D.C. to go to the National Archives, going to Philadelphia to go to the Maritime Museum Library, going to Wilmington to talk with the North Carolina underwater archaeology people. And that's what I do in the off-season is research things. And I've been working on a series of books that I keep, well, I just need to find one more thing. <laughs> yeah. And sooner or later, I have to put start putting them out. But I haven't done it yet. I've also been working on a few things like possible TV shows and things like that. And we've done a couple TV show episodes here and there. We did one for French TV last year. Um, that's kind of sidetracked me a little bit this year. Um, but do people ever dive for around here? Do they dive for the artifacts or? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> now it's not as big as it used to be because one thing I will tell you is the wrecks that we're looking for are going to be the ones with the artifacts right. because nobody's been there before because nobody knows what it is, where it is. Right. The ones that are in easily divable depths, and I'm going to say that that's like around a hundred feet, you know. 70 to 150, uh, 200 feet. Those have been picked over because people have been there. Okay. But sometimes you find things that people have missed on those wrecks. I'm not a big artifact hunter. Many of my friends, that's what they live for. Yeah. Um, and the, a lot of the artifacts have been donated to museums now. And that's a good thing, you know. So you can go out there and look for things even on the shipwrecks that have been dived thousands of times, and sometimes you uncover stuff, but the real place would be an un undiscovered wreck. Right. So, yeah, it definitely still happens. Now, there's rules about it. I was going to say, there's got to be protections there. Three, three, three miles or less from shore, 
Don't touch anything. Sorry. It's illegal. It's against North Carolina state law. If you're going to touch anything that is within three miles to shore, you need to get a permit. You can't take things off of those shipwrecks. Now, there's plenty of things that came off of those shipwrecks before that was, that law was being enforced, but you can't you can't wreck you can't take things off those. Uh, once you get past three miles offshore, it's really a gray area because technically those wrecks probably belong to the in- <coughs> sorry the insurance company that paid off the claim. But many of those companies don't exist anymore or just don't care. Right. And therefore, you can kind of take things off of them in that gray area. Right. And lots of artifacts have come up. You may not take anything off of a vessel owned by the United States at the time it sank. Huh. Okay. Now, that even gets weird because... If it had been bought by a salvage company, it no longer belonged to the United States. Right. But if it sank as a United States vessel, you're not allowed to take anything off of it. Right. So there are merchant rules. ship. I guess a merchant ship kind of falls under that. During merchant the war? ships, uh, unless they were um, owned by the government, no, you okay. pretty much in in the zone where unless you get a call from a company, you you know it's like you found something. Right. Interesting. Do you ever... Uh, what's your favorite local dive? My favorite local dive is probably the wreck of the Mirac off of the end of Diamond Shoals. It's in a very high current area. It's a very tough dive because you're mostly going to be drift diving it. And we don't get to go there very often. It was sunk on the same day that the Diamond Shoals light ship was sunk in World War One by a German submarine. <laughs> And it's upside down, and you can swim into it, and it's really neat. And just a visually spectacular wreck, because the prop is still there. The the wreck's mostly intact, and just flipped upside down and broken into two pieces. Right. That's one of my favorites. And then probably the coolest wreck on the Outer Banks is the E.M. Clark, which is also one of the deeper ones we dive. It's 250 feet to the bottom, and it's this giant oil tanker that is lying on its side and basically still intact. Like, the wheelhouse has fallen off and into the sand, but the hull still maintains most of its integrity. You can go inside, the steam engine's in there. It's really cool. Yeah. But at the... Other end of the depth range, there's wrecks on Diamond Shoals that are just unbelievable. And one of them's a British ore carrier. It was carrying iron ore. And it's in unbelievably good condition for where it sits. It's in 40 feet of water, blue, warm during the summer. And it's challenging to dive because of the current. One thing that's pretty common about most of these wrecks is they can be very challenging to dive right but you know i've got wrecks that are my favorite that are deep and wrecks that are shallow and kind of everything in between right i was looking at some of your photographs and the the sea life is just amazing oh my gosh the the it's like tropical fish i mean we are incredibly lucky we live in a place that has sea life that is just amazing yeah i've gone and dived a few other places not many like a lot of my friends have been all over the world diving that's one thing about outer banks diving you're going to meet some of the big names in the business quickly because they come here to dive is that right yeah it's it's a little bit of a secret i guess (laughs) you know but i have not been that many places but the places i've been I find myself saying, wow, this is cool. This is almost as good as home. <laughs> right. But we have the giant bait balls of fish. We have the sand tiger sharks. And they can be out there in the hundreds on these shipwrecks. We have divers that come here just to dive with the sharks. That's what they're here really? for. Yeah. We, we have big schools of sand tigers, especially on the wrecks off of Ocracoke, such as the Dixie Arrow and the Proteus. Um 
they pretty much don't mess with you most of the time because we dive them <laughs> during the day. That sounded a little vague. I don't know. <laughs> I've had a few episodes here and there. Um, but they're mostly asleep, it seems like. The, their version of asleep is just sort of meandering slowly into the current. Yeah, right. And they don't get very excited about anything unless you bump into them or you shoot a fish near them and they actually get some fish blood in the water. But most of the time, they're just very... I, I, I swear it's almost like they're asleep. Is that right? Um, we have other sharks here. We've seen... I missed the great white last year. Uh, we saw a great white. Um, there's bull sharks, nurse sharks, all kinds of sharks, but by far the most... You see so many sand tigers some days that it's mind-boggling. Is that right? Yeah, you just... You can't believe you're in the water with a thousand sharks. I mean, I have pulled the hook when we were leaving a wreck before, and there were no sharks on the wreck that day, which I thought was unusual. And... I'm drifting off into the current, climbing up the anchor line, headed back to the boat, and I turn around, and there's sand tigers, 10 deep, <laughs> packed, and a line as far as I can see. And I could see about 150 feet that day, and wow, I don't know how far that line went. But it's like, well, you know, when you're down here and you don't see a shark, don't think that means they're not around. But it was just amazing. What do you, what do you hundreds think? Hundreds and hundreds. Were they looking at you or were they just hanging in the draft? They were any, just hanging the, above the shipwreck. There were, yeah. there were amber jacks tearing up the bait fish on the shipwreck. And I think that they were just hanging out above it going, okay, we'll wait till it starts getting dark and then we're going to go eat these amber jacks or yeah. something. I don't know. And just so many of them that it kind of just made you stop and just you're almost just turned off for a second it's like you couldn't you can't believe that many sharks but they're just out there this is the ocean and like i said with these three bodies of water that meet at the outer banks you can see things in the northern outer banks like fish that like The colder water, because the colder water starts north of the Diamond Shoals, but the Gulf Stream might push into the colder water, and it makes this break between the green and the blue water, and there's fish that like to hang out on that break, like manta rays and mola molas. You see those on that green-blue break, right? and that green-blue break can be crazy. It's often, we'll have top water like ice blue 80 degree top water and 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 if you're uh, i've dived off of straight off of here off of kitty hawk on a wreck called the mexicano it was 83 degrees in the top water because this wreck is about i believe it's 36 miles straight out of from here okay and it's 140 150 feet deep and you get down to about 100 feet and you see this green break in the water coming up like smoke coming off of it and I I was getting ready to tie the hook in and I got to the green break and I was seeing all these crazy fish that like to hang out on that break and just digging the fish and I stuck my hand into that green water and it went from 80 (laughs) degrees to 59 in two feet wow wow this is cool (laughs) You know, so you get that interaction between the waters here. So you can see all kinds of northern fish species. Right. You can see all kinds of southern fish species, stuff that lives down south and stuff that lives up north. And then you've got these Gulf Stream species. Right. You've got things like wahoo and tunas that like that blue warm water that's moving. Right. You've got these pelagic species. You've got oyster toads. You've got sand tigers, you've got bluefish, you've got tautogs, and everything you can think of. You can pretty much see it off the Outer Banks. Uh, Unfortunately, the lionfish have started taking over, and since I started working on the boats 14 years ago, it's gone from a lionfish here and there to lionfish 
all over these wrecks. I heard that uh, Dave Cyber was telling me the exact same thing. So yes. what does that mean? They're displacing native species. They're not supposed to be here. They're from the South Pacific, but somehow they got out into the Gulf Stream and it's a perfect environment for them. You know, we'd like to get rid of them if we could, but what it means to me is, okay, I have noticed since I started diving off of Cape Hatteras, since I started diving off of Ocracoke, the water temperature when I first started diving there, say around 2010, was on an average day like 75 degrees in the middle of the summer. These days, sometimes that Gulf Stream seems to come through and it's just warmer. Yeah. It, I mean, not going to even go there about politics or anything, <laughs> what people want to believe, but I'll tell you, the water's getting warmer. Yeah. And this 83 degree average temperature that we've had for the past three years, what I've seen, and this is, affects my diet greatly. I used to <laughs> love to spear trigger fish. Yeah. And I could go to the Rex off Ocracoke and load up with a pole spear and a stringer and come home with 10, 15 trigger fish. Nowadays, I hardly see any trigger fish at all. And what's out there is a lionfish. I think they like that a little bit colder water, and I think the lionfish have been displacing them onto the wrecks to the point where it's changed things. And you know, it's kind of neat too, you're seeing some tropical species that are thicker out there, you know, things like uh, blue angel fish, and we have these uh, red fish, they're red and yellow, and I believe they're called spot fin hogfish. They're, they're becoming more prominent on the wrecks because I think they like the warmer temperatures. And they're really pretty and they make great photographic subjects. Right. They're supposed to be here, so it's good. But yeah, things like the black sea bass and in some places the sheep's head, there's less of them out there and more lionfish. Right. Um, Sean Harper at the aquarium has been working up projects where they are doing experiments, counting lionfish and seeing where they're multiplying. And they've been trying to see if it's possible to mitigate them with divers spearing them or some other method, you know. Uh, they'll go down and they'll count the lionfish on their first dive and they'll shoot the lionfish on their second dive. Then they'll come back a couple, like a month or two later and recount the same area. Right. And, and what, what I'm seeing is we're losing that battle. <laughs> right. I mean, they're everywhere. Right. And they are good eating, so... If the lionfish. You, yeah. Okay. It, they are very toxic, though. I thought I heard that, too, yeah. Yeah, I've been stung by one before, and I do not recommend it. <laughs> it, it felt like my hand was on fire. Um, so when you, you, you guys launched the boat from Hatteras, are you motoring it all the way to Ocracoke when you're diving Ocracoke? Yeah, we dive a lot off of Ocracoke. Um, we, we have a 42-foot sport fisherman, Duffy, called the Lion's Paw that I work on. Very seaworthy vessel, very tough. Um, we dive a lot off Ocracoke because it's very, it's the most conductive to diving. But we also like to dive up off of Hatteras, and sometimes we go a little north of there. Um, going north of there is a rare day. And it's kind of like a, a treat to go up there. Um, going to the Diamond Shoals is a very rare day because the current makes it a risky sure. poor opposition. Um, if you have the skills on board, if you have a good group of divers on board, it opens up other things you can dive. But the, the Ocracoke wrecks are really awesome and we go to them a lot. So it's just a function of what's going to be better on what day. Right. How many divers do you typically take out on a trip? We are a uninspected passenger vessel six pack, so we take six. Okay. And there and, used to and be they're some, all paying customers. Yes, yeah. and there used to be some some vessels that were inspected and carried more divers. Uh, that they call those cattle boats in the in the dive industry. Right. Um, we're a little more specialized in that kind of dive boat. We usually rent the boat out to, well, not rent the boat out, but we run charters with groups. Right. 
and usually the groups are put together by themselves and we don't do a whole lot of charters where we're just having people walk on right i can see that be beneficial to you too because those groups are probably used to working with each other and yeah, we've got groups that want to go spearfishing. We've got groups that want to dive deep stuff. We've got groups that want to go take pictures. We've got everything in between. And they're way more advanced divers than what you would see on a inspected passenger vessel, say in Florida. Right. Or, or, or there's a number off of North Carolina. They're more down off of Moorhead City. But we're a little more specialized here. There used to be um, cattle boats in the Outer Banks, and it's sad that the dive industry have shrunk, um, but we don't take out uh, new divers very much. Right, because you need to be experienced. You need to be experienced. It's it's a, a challenging kind of diving here most of the time. What do you think about the people that dive the stuff right off the shore here? I mean, is that Oh, just... I do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I well, love it. It's unbelievable. Um that uh actually the roanoke island dive shop does guided tours you know they have a dive master that will take you diving you can rent equipment and do that so it's available to uh new divers um and then if you're adventuresome you know there's more wrecks out there than what they dive there's a i've dived 21 near shore wrecks on the outer banks and I'm actually, one of the books I'm working on are about the near shore wrecks. Okay. And there's wrecks that I may be one of three people that have ever dived on near yeah. shore. And sometimes crazy close to other well-known things. But, you know, you've got you've to put your time in to know that. Right. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's one of the few places where you can walk off the beach and just dive a shipwreck, which is kind of cool. But at the same time, you need to be fairly skilled... If you're not going with a dive master, you have to be able to take care of your own problems. Right. That's another reason why I say surfers make good divers. They know what the ocean's like. Yeah. They know that it's not going to wait for you. But, you know, some days during the summer, it'll get an ice blue here. It looks like Caribbean out there. And people are like, that never happens. It's like, yeah, well, you should have been here yesterday. Yeah. But you, like I said, you got to put your time in. Do you have a favorite near shore wreck? Oh, I've got a couple. I probably... The Triangle Wrecks in Kill Devil Hills are really cool. There's two shipwrecks that happened in the same spot two years apart. And that's probably the most dived. Um, But then there's ones that I've been the only person who's ever dived on. Well, me and a couple of my friends. Um, And my favorite one's probably called the Sheridan, which a friend of mine found years ago while wreck hunting. And never dived it because the water was very cloudy those days. And we happened to get on it with my friend Reese. uh, And we were the first people that ever dived it, at least that knew what it probably was. And it it was a Civil War blockade runner. Then it was captured by the, uh, United States Navy and it was converted into a United States blockade vessel and then after the war I called them the great wrecks of 1866 where the US Navy unloaded their vessels and lots of new captains were sailing up and down the east coast of the United States and there's a lot of wrecks that happened in 1866 and we identified it by the steam engine and it's a pretty, pretty interesting story, but that's just one of many vessels out there. You know, right. the, there's a lot of Civil War Bureau vessels out there. Yeah, you know, be. most of them are on the near shore, such as the Metropolis, which was the USS Stars and Stripes, the Andrew Johnson, which is up in Kerala. Also, both of the Metropolis and the Andrew Johnson were in Kerala. Um, what was called Currituck Beach back then. They were both U.S. Navy war horses. And they wrecked in 1866 and I believe 1877. And they're just off of Kerala. You can dive them. They're very interesting wrecks. Great amount of history. Hardly anybody knows about them. And that's the Outer Banks. (laughs) That's where we are. That sort of thing happened. Um, 
When you're diving from the beach, are you free diving? Mm, sometimes. I mean, we'll go out there and just snorkel and free dive. Uh, I generally tend to take tanks because I like to do photography. Lots of people out there spearing fish. Yeah. You kids be careful. I see what's <laughs> happening out there. Um, but there's so many shipwrecks off the Outer Banks that... There's many that haven't been discovered, and the ones that haven't been discovered are either very shallow off of the beach or very deep. And we also dive deep shipwrecks that are incredible history subjects, like the USS Monitor. We're planning on going there this year. That's also a Civil War wreck, probably the most famous wreck of the Civil War, you know. Is that a popular wreck because of its history? It's very popular in the public eye because of its history, because half of it's in the monitor, in, monitor exhibit at, at the ECU? Mariner's Museum. Mariner's Museum in Newport News. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, uh, and if you want to see some really cool stuff, go to the Mariner's Museum and check that exhibit okay. out. Um, the other half is in 230 feet of water out off of Hatteras, and we've I've been lucky enough to have dived it three times. Um, we're tr going to try to go back this year. I believe a couple groups want to go. It's really neat. You can't remove anything from it, but that makes it kind of neat. I mean, if you go to the Mariner's Museum, one of the exhibits is uh, mustard bottles because, you know, during the era of non-refrigeration, you were eating stuff like Salt pork right. and salt beef and hardtack and navy soup and they had their grog ration and that was pretty nasty food so they had lots of sauces to put on it to make it taste a little better. <laughs> and the, these little mustard bottles were all over the wreck and last time I was there I saw one. I was like, wow, that's really cool. You know, it, it's not been gone over except for you know the stuff they removed um like the turret and things but you know a lot of the stuff's still on the wreck i mean i know where there's uh things like deck lights which are sort of portholes that were in the floor and right? things like that you know it's still all over the wreck it's neat is that um what, what's the coolest thing you found um the at a wreck Coolest thing I've ever found in a wreck. I, I'm not going to talk about yet. Okay. It's in the book. <laughs> going to have to buy the book. <laughs> may, 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 maybe it gets donated to a museum after this year. We're hoping. All right. Uh, but yeah, there's things, there, there's neat stuff. I've been around when the bell of the Proteus was found by my friend Alan. Yeah. That's um, like a big deal when you find a ship's bell, right? Because it confirms yeah. the identity. Oh, and... absolutely. It's big brass has the ship's name on it. Yeah. You know? Um, my friend Mike Boring about a decade ago had a what they called the meeting of the bells, and they, they brought people had brought their bells to his house and they had a big party and it was really neat you know huh. so I still look at pictures from that, um, the uh, things like bells and telegraphs where the engine orders were sent over really? from the engine room to the bridge and from the bridge to the engine room, things oh, yeah. like that, you know, just classic pieces of shipwreck. Wow. Uh, any local dives you're, that are on your wish list? Oh, I've got 30 or so. <laughs> 30 more? <laughs> yeah, at least. Um, is there a priority of that or is it just kind of, you know, whatever? There are discuss? some that are going to be easier than others. There, there are some that are very difficult to get to. The weather, the distance, you know, there's stuff up off the Virginia border that I would like to dive. There's stuff that's really, really deep and it's going to be very challenging. Um, and then there's stuff that's buried most of the time that right. you just have to keep going back to the spot and looking at and hoping you see something. Right. And that happens a lot with the nearshore wrecks, especially with things like, uh, where they're pumping sand onto the beaches for renourishment. It's like, I don't know how, how many people consider, hey, you're burying the shipwrecks. But then again, shipwrecks that get buried, you come back and see another day and they get preserved. So it's not necessarily a horrible thing, but it makes it challenging. You, like I said, you got to put your time in. Right. And that means walking off the beach going, I don't know if we're going to see it or not. 
you know. How many new wrecks do you think you're averaging a year? If you're if you have a bucket list of all these wrecks. Oh, uh, it's more like a, a new wreck every year or two, hopefully. Okay. I mean, I got on a new wreck last year, and then it had been two years before that, and it, you've just got to. And then there's lots of things like these shipwrecks are huge. We got this wreck called the Lansing. They call it the Slick Wreck because it's still got oil leaking out of it. It's a British. It was a whaling ship converted to an oil tanker, and it sits at 170 feet of water off of just south of Cape Hatteras. And when you get down there and look at this ship, which is upside down and mostly intact, you just realize how badly the Germans were tearing up the East Coast shipping during 1942. I mean, this thing is massive. It's like almost 500 feet long, 50 feet tall. Wow. And you're just going, wow. They sunk take you so week. many of these. It takes you a week yeah. to look at the whole thing. Exactly. You have to go back. It's 170 feet of water. You get 20 or 30 minutes on the bottom, and you have to do at least that much decompression coming up. You've got to have some skills to do these wrecks. So... You don't have that much time on it. So it means every time I go back there, I'm looking at new parts of the ship. I have like lists of things I want to go check out on these shipwrecks. Right. Do you have a journal like afterwards you write about all of your dives and what you experienced and any information you gather? I do sort of keep track of things like that, but mostly I take pictures. When I'm there, I'm looking at these wrecks through the viewfinder. Sure. And... I consider a good dive one I got a lot of good pictures on. Right. And I go back and look at photo files from different days and what we dived and see that hole there? We need to see what's inside that. Right. You know, I, I go back and look at things and go, what's that little thing sticking out of the side there? And, and, and I'll go back and then I'll investigate that on my next dive. Right. And these things you have to do in steps especially deep wreck diving. You don't just go in and do everything. You, you go in, then you come back out and you do your decompression and then you do your mental decompression over like the next couple weeks and you think of, okay, I want to go in that spot when I get back there. And you might even write down two or three things you want to check out. Because it might be a year, right? Yeah, it might be five years. <laughs> right. And there have been a few that it's been five, six years since I've been to, and I have lists of things I want to do. Right. And you don't want to swim inside some big unexplored shipwreck and go five, you, know, you want to go 10 feet in. You don't want to go 50 feet in. Right. You want to check out the stuff as you go. You want to know where you are and you want to make it back out. You know, it can be very challenging. Um, so everything needs to happen in steps. You've got to have patience. You've got to say, we'll get it again on the next trip. Are you talking this out with your teammates at all? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I'm building a team with a bunch of my friends. We're, we are building a team together. Yeah. And we have goals. And do you have roles? Yes, yeah. We have people who, like my friend Panda, is learning the ropes, and she's helping us out sometimes on the deeper dives by watching over us. She'll be our support diver. She'll come down and see if we've got all the gases we need to breathe on the way up. She'll check us out and make sure we're doing okay. And if not, she's going to help us. And we've got people like who've got a lot of experience, rebreathers and all kinds of skills that are going to the bottom. And then we've got people that are halfway there who, who some days, like if we go dive something that's incredibly deep, we might have three support divers. Wow. Or we might have five people going to the bottom. It all depends. And everybody sort of has a role. We've got photographers. We've got videographers. We've got people that are looking at artifacts. Um, kind of everything we try to cover and that's where deep diving is headed, especially because of the use of rebreathers. You know, is more. I think it used to be more. Everybody was on their own. Is that right? 
and now it's turning more into team oriented goals. Do you ever look for like corporate sponsorship at all or, or um, grants or anything? I haven't really gotten too into that sort of realm. Is that a thing? Is that even a thing? It's a, it's a thing with, with some groups. And, you know, there's a lot of TV shows about diving. And I have lots of friends who are doing things like that. And, you know, maybe we're trying to do a little bit of that. Um, as far as corporate sponsorship... The big dive companies tend to not be the ones that we're using for our gear because we're using sort of more specialized gear, And but that's good. Like the regulator company that I use, I can call and talk to the owner and he can help me out if I need pieces to fix things or I'm having a problem with something. So it's a little more specialized, but they don't have like giant corporate money for the most part. Right. You know, so, and it's a very small world, you know, like I said, uh, within a few years, I had met lots of the big names in diving. Um, so we pretty much are on our own as far as financing and, you know, everybody puts in their time and money. And how do you guys come up with a plan? Do you guys, you know, start saying, Hey, let's look at this next place or let's, Let's have these five shipwrecks on our list and start doing some research there. Yeah, we have like priorities of places we want to go. Right. You know, which if the weather lets you go there, hey, this is the day. Yeah. And if the weather decides it doesn't want to let you go there, well, you pick another thing on your priority list. And it's a long-term thing. Right. You, you're, you're not going to dive every wreck out there most likely i've realized that my goal may be impossible but i'm trying to dive as many of them i'm at 60 now so i'm doing okay yeah um definitely priorities sort of almost impose themselves on what we're doing right you know and some things just make sense on some days are you since you're a carpenter builder Kind of guy, are you just hammering away nails and just waiting for the weather to break? <laughs> yeah, kind you, you pretty of. Pretty much just drop kinda, everything. Yeah, and yeah the especially during the dive season. Yeah. Um, I, I pretty much will drop whatever I'm doing, and usually I have customers that that works with, and I try to work with those kind of customers during the summer, and then I'll take my bigger projects during the off season. Right. Um. But I also have a friend I go to wreck hunting with. We might not go diving, but we might go looking for wrecks, and we'll, we'll try to do that year-round. So I, I've always got to prioritize that. But like I said, you just got... It, the, the more you want to do, the more you have to prioritize what you want to do, and you have to set aside the time to do it. And I've been very fortunate. It's very much the surfing lifestyle. You know, yeah. surfers will drop everything yep. when the conditions present themselves. Yeah, you got to go when the uh, yeah. opportunity arises. And you want to be Spicoli, not Karen. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, any any future dives you want to talk about right now, or are they all hush-hush? Or... Um, well, as far as future dives go, I've got a number of things that we know where they are, such as let's let's say there's one called the Bar Q. I've never dived, and it's way out off Corolla. It's like 250 feet deep. That's something that we're going to have to work around because we don't have a boat we can do it with very easily right now. Because you'd have to go out of Oregon Inlet or Virginia Beach. Right. So things like that, you know, it's like that's a big target everybody wants to go there and it's been dived in the past my friend jt who is one of my main mentors dove it quite a bit but it hasn't been nobody's been there in like 15 years probably you know so things like that you know any chance you can get to go to something like that if if you were to get it you're going to prioritize that more than say going to the dixie arrow for the 500th time right. off of Ochre Coke. Right. Not to say that the Dixie Arrow is not a great dive, because it is, but it, it just... They, they sort of make the... The, the, the priorities sort of make themselves. Right. 
with the uh, conditions and just yeah you've got the conditions and the people you're going to be working with you know if you've got if you've got a bunch of people on the boat who can really dive some deep stuff who are really skilled well that opens doors for you and then if you've got people who are less skilled but maybe they still have enough skills to go dive something in a real high current well then that opens other doors you know you just got to make you got to look at what's going on and say, we're going to do this today because the conditions are presenting themselves. Right. right. So, so you got to, you got to be pretty flexible. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. So what's the name of the boat you work on? I work on the lion's paw out of Hatteras Inlet. Um, other dive boats in the area are dive, Dave Seibert runs lots of free diving spearfishing charters off the northern outer banks, and he goes off of Hatteras some. And uh, we lost uh, Matt's no longer running out of Oregon Inlet. Uh, he was going out of Wong Cheese, but he's kind of done with it. And so we don't really have a big dive boat that is operating out of the northern outer banks at all right now so right now if you wanted to dive like the u85 german submarine that was big dive off the outer banks it's kind of hard to get to right now yeah you know and uh if somebody was an experienced diver and wanted to go on a trip down here uh how would they get how would they get in touch with you guys uh divehatteris.com is our website and you need to get in touch with captain dave pretty early like i'd say call january and unfortunately, we're booked pretty solid. Wow. It's hard to get on a dive charter here. It's easier to get on one out of Wilmington or Moorhead City. There's just not as many dive boats here. And I hope that changes in the future. I want to keep running dive boats after uh, my friend Dave, who's running the Lion's Paw, retires. I want to do something. You know, we got to keep Outer Banks diving alive. But it takes a lot of time, effort, and money. And right. You know, the fact of the matter is you can make a lot more money running fishing charters. And the the amount of skills it takes to go diving are very high. I mean, I'm not going to knock anybody running fishing charters. It's tough out there doing that, too. I mean, but it's a specialized set of skills that not everybody has. So it's like the number of possible boats that could go diving isn't even that high. You know, you've got to have a captain who knows what they're doing. Yeah. And that's very specialized. Right. Any projects or businesses you want to promote? Well, uh, just Dive Hatteras is, is our business and JT Barker at uh, Under Pressure Charters. Um, he's not taking as many new people anymore as he used to. Um, Roanoke Island Dive Center uh, provides... Uh, Beach tour diving uh, on the nearshore shipwrecks. They're a good operation. Very cool. Um, go check out the North Carolina Aquarium. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like diving uh, <laughs> in a few spots in there. Right. Um, and I encourage anybody who wants to get into diving, especially anybody who wants to run a boat, that, hey, you've got an opportunity here, but it's not going to be the easiest thing no. in the world. You better love it. Yeah, you better love diving. Uh, you're you're going to have a tough time if you just want to make money. <laughs> yeah, and you better be a professional. No yeah, need to. you better know what you're doing. Yeah. Well, Mark, uh, this was a great talk. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming out today. All right. Well, thank you, and take care. I want to thank Mark Corbett for sitting down with me for this episode. If you're a serious diver, you can probably look him up, but make sure you plan way ahead of time. If you want to live vicariously through Mark, you can probably just find him on Facebook where he shares a lot of his underwater photos. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and until next time, make it a good one.